This sermon is titled Conquer Through Rest. Be enriched as you listen. Several testimonies came in. Uh, just quickly run through them. Uh, we had a testimony, and all of these came in this past week, um, but they were things that, uh, that happened to the ministry the last several Sundays before that. Uh, several Sundays ago, uh, one of the, as, as we were ministering, one of the uh, words that were given was about money, God, uh, um, you know, the, the God who put money in the mouth of a fish can minister to you, provide for you. And there was, again, somebody watching online. And uh, he had been working for over a year, uh, had not yet received uh, things. And he was in a very difficult uh, situation. And so right after that, now he believed God. He joined in prayer. And right after that, he received information and he received money, uh, you know, paid full for one year's worth of work. Amen. And there were some other things he's also expecting. Uh, it's a wonderful testimony. Uh, another testimony about a workplace-related situation several Sundays ago, and this again was somebody who tuned in online, and uh, uh, and, and this uh, person wrote that you know for over ten days she was she was in a real difficult situation in a workplace, and um, she was getting discouraged, frustrated. Uh, but on Sunday, the 24th October, she says she tuned in online for the Sunday service, and there was a word that was released from here that. Our people who are in a seemingly defeated place will be brought out of defeat into a place of victory. So as soon as she heard that word, she, you know, believed God and said, God, that's for me. And wonderfully, God gave her wisdom so, uh, uh, and clarity on how to solve the problems that she was facing at work. Monday, she says, she went to work. Uh, she got a sense of what she had to do. Uh, she went in there. She did the things that she had to do, and she got all the correct results. And she says, I give praise to God. Amen. God brought her out of a place of defeat to a place of victory in her workplace. There are also three healing testimonies, all of severe, all of back issues. Last Sunday, we had uh, this time of ministry for people with back problems. Now, I don't know what exactly the medical conditions of their back problems are because it, it's not mentioned. Uh, uh, this and uh, so one person was watching online. So this email is about the person who's watching online. Uh, he, uh, he wrote. He said Saturday morning he woke up and there was uh, uh, to his shock he found and he just started couldn't get out of bed. There was sharp pain going from uh, his back, left all the way down to hip to the knee. He couldn't stand up without support. So they did pray at home and he joined in prayer Sunday morning. Uh, he was planning to go to the doctor, which is not a wrong thing. It's a good thing to do. Uh, but, but what happened? He joined on, online with this service. And he says, Monday morning I woke up and the pain was completely gone. So we don't know what the situation was, but that was his experience. I thank God for that. There were two other people, again, with back, back problems. Uh, one uh, shared their testimony in person. One sent it on WhatsApp. Uh, all healed of their back issues. Amen? Let's give God praise. Thank you, God. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll be receiving many more testimonies and thanking God for this. All right. Let's get into God's Word. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, conquer through rest. All right. If you have somebody sitting on the other side, tell them, conquer through rest. All right. But don't go to rest right now. <laughs> you need to be awake for the message. You can practice it afterwards. And Amy was joking as we were driving from our East service here. She said, you can tell the congregation I practiced your message <laughs> after hearing it at East. So <laughs> she was resting in the car, <laughs> taking a nap. <laughs> anyway, so uh, conquer through rest. We're going to read several scriptures. Um, First, we're going to uh, begin with Exodus chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 3, uh, verses 7 and 8. So we're going to read uh, 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 several passages today. And I want you to please uh, follow the train of thought, uh, turn in your scriptures, and we are going to read these together. Exodus 3, 7 and 8. Exodus chapter 3, verses, verse 7 and 8. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry, 
because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the land, out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from that land to go to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. We're also going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we will read verses 1 and 2. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Now, one of the things about reading the Old Testament and looking at the Old Testament stories recorded for us is that our approach should be, we're not just looking at historical information that these things happened there. But we are to look for spiritual truth that we can apply in our lives. So in the New Testament, and I'm just referencing 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 10, and also Romans 15, verse 3, the New Testament teaches us that the things that happened to the people in the Old Testament happened to them as examples for us that we could learn from those examples. So as we read these stories, as we read about God's dealing with His people, bringing them out of Egypt, taking them into the promised land, and all that He did with them as they you know, continued in their journey with God, there are examples, there are messages, spiritual truth for you and me to draw and apply in our lives. So here we read two passages where God is speaking to His people while they were in hard labor in Egypt, they were under taskmasters, hard labor. And God says, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. I'm going to take you into your promised land. In Exodus, he says, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's simply a picture of saying, it's a land of blessing. So the promised land was a land of Blessing. But then we read in Exodus, in Deuteronomy 7, where he says, you know, when you come into your promised land, you're going to face enemies, tribes, nations, who are bigger and stronger than you are, mightier than you are. Seven nations you're going to face. But the Lord will deliver them to you, and you will conquer them. So the promised land was not just a place of blessing, it was a place of battles. But the promised land was a land given to the people. It was their land. No questions. God said, I'm giving it to you. The promised land that God had for his people in the Old Testament is a type, it's a prefiguring, it's a foreshadowing, it's a pointer to to the promises that God has made available to you and me, the provisions that God has made available to you and me through the cross of Jesus Christ. That is our promised land as New Testament believers. What God has made available to us through Jesus Christ. Every promise spoken in God's Word is your promised land. Amen? Amen? It's your promised land. It's there for you to go and take it. But not only is the promised land a place of blessing, it's also a place of battles. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, but it's also got enemies that are stronger and bigger than you are, but God will help you conquer them. God will help you, but you've got to engage. 
So the promised land is not a place of blessing that's offered to you and me on a platter, so to speak. It is yours, but you've got to engage in battle to possess the milk and honey. Are you with me? Now that's the interpretation, the application of that Old Testament dealing with people, God's people, for you and me as New Testament believers. But the scriptures bring out some more insights on this. So let's go to Psalm 95, please. We're going to read a few more passages. Psalm 95, and we're going to read verses 6 through 11. And in this passage, I want you to look out for what else does God say about the promised land? What does he call the land of promise? We're going to read Psalm 95, verses 6 through 11. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So here's, here again, the scripture passage is revealing to us God's dealings with his people in the Old Testament. How as he was taking them from Egypt into the promised land, they were stubborn, they were rebellious, they wanted to go back. All kinds of excuses. God, there were onions and garlics in Egypt. Typical Indians. <laughs> no, I was joking. <laughs> onions and garlics, we want that. You know. What about that food? We want meat. We want bread. We want water. Uh, they were just complaining, grumbling, so on and so forth. Finally, they just refused to go in. And so God was, you know, so these preceding verses are telling us that how God was so distressed by those people. And finally he said, verse 11, You will not enter my rest. So the promised land was a land of rest. In Egypt, it was a land of hard work, a lot of work, labor, forced labor. And God is saying, I was taking you to a place of rest, but you didn't want it. You were under hard labor. I'm taking you to a place of rest. You didn't want it. You're there in Egypt. I'm taking you from being slaves into a land where you can be free, enjoying milk and honey. Didn't want it. You were in hard labor. I'm taking you to a place of rest. You didn't want it. Because they were afraid of the battles. They were afraid of the giants. They were afraid of the conquests that they had to engage in. So the promised land is a land of blessing. It's a land of rest. But there are battles and there are conquests to be made. Are you with me? Now, in Hebrews, chapters 3 and 4, the writer of Hebrews takes all of this and he translates it as truth for New Testament believers. And he begins to apply that to you and me. And so we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 3 and see what the writer of Hebrews has to tell us, New Testament believers, saying, this is what God intended to do, but these are the reasons why they did not enter their place of blessing, their place of rest. But they didn't experience what God had already kept for them. God had already kept this. 
Nobody could take that land away from them because God already planned that. But they still didn't enter. What were the reasons? So as we read Hebrews chapter 3, we're going to read from verse 16 of chapter 3 all the way to verse 11 of chapter 4. Now remember, in, 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 the, in the way it was originally written, it wasn't written in, in chapter and verse, so it was just one train of thought. So we're going to follow that train of thought from verse 16 of chapter 3 to verse 11 of chapter 4. And as we read this, I want you to observe what the writer of Hebrews mentions as reasons why these people could not enter in to the rest, the place of rest, the place of blessing that God had already ordained for them. Because that is the message he's giving to us as New Testament believers. He's saying, believers, God has all these promises for you, but you're not entering in. What's going to keep you out? We'll find out right here. Let's go from verse 16. For who, having heard, rebels? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. First reason. They could not Enter in because of unbelief. And he continues. Chapter 4 verse 1. And since a promise remains of entering his rest. That means that same promise is for you and me. It remains for you and me to enter his rest. His rest meaning this land of promise. Let us fear. Us New Testament believers. We must fear. I mean don't take this lightly. Take this seriously. We must fear. Hold this with reverence. Since there is a promise awaiting for you and me to enter into. Since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So he's talking to us believers. That you fall short of entering your land of promise. Verse 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Look at verse 2. For the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word preached to them did not profit them. So, the word preached to them. What was it? It was a promise. We read it. Exodus 3, God said, I'm taking you from where you are to a land of milk and honey. That was the word, the promise given. Deuteronomy 7. I'm going to take you to this land. There are enemies, but I'll help you conquer all of them. That word preached to them, the promise given to them, did not benefit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Did they hear the promise? Of course they heard it. Moses told them, there's a land flowing with milk and honey. God says it's yours. There's a land, there are seven nations bigger than you, but God says he'll help you conquer them. That's for you. They heard the promise. They knew the promise. But it didn't benefit them. Why? They didn't mix faith with the promise. And the writer of Hebrews says, that same thing is given to you and me. The gospel. The gospel, God's package, God's message. To you and me. Is preached to us. Have you heard it? Yeah. Some of us have heard the promises many times. Will the promise automatically happen in our lives just because you hear it? No. 
What's required? We must mix faith with the word which we hear. Otherwise, the message we hear doesn't benefit us. It only adds to our information storage, but it doesn't benefit because we must mix faith with the word that we hear. Let's read on. For we who have believed, verse 3 of chapter 4, for we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, so I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. He's quoting Psalm 95, verse 11. Verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of, of what? Disobedience. Here's the second one. First, he mentioned unbelief. That was uh, verse 19 of chapter 3. Now he's saying, because of disobedience. Verse 7. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua, Jesus, had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. That means he's saying, look, that is a type or a shadow. We have before us the reality. The other day, another day spoken of is the reality. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. That means we, for us, there is a rest that's awaiting us for us to enter into. For he who has entered his rest has himself also seized from his works as God did from his. Verse 11, let us therefore, us New Testament believers, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. What can we learn? So, this place of rest. So let's just back up. The promised land. It was a place of battles, but also a place of blessing. It was a place of conquest, but it was also a place of rest. Now that promised land for them typifies the promises and the provisions God has given to you and me as believers. Because it's talking about the word that was preached. Now... Rest. What's he talking about? He explains it to us. The rest he's talking to us is a place where we enter into the works that God has completed for us. So he gives two illustrations, or two pointers. Verse 3. Even as God finished his works before the foundation of the world. He's saying, look, God completed his works before he started. God completed his works before he started creating. What does that mean? In the mind of God, it was all done. He's Alpha and Omega. He's at the end, at the beginning. So he saw the end at the very beginning. In the mind of God, the works was done. It was completed before the foundation of the world. Even before he started creation, creation was complete in the mind of God. So he's referring to the completed works. Another, time, another thing he points to is the seven days of creation. He says, six days God worked, seventh day he rested because the works were completed. That's verse 4. So he says, that's what I'm talking about. So what is rest? It's a place of entering into what God has already completed for us. You enter in. 
He also says in verse 10, He who has entered this rest has ceased from his own works. That means now I'm in a place where I'm not striving, where I'm not trying to do the works which God himself has done. Are you with me so far? Yes? No? Maybe? Coming up? <laughs> it's okay. So, he who has entered into his rest has ceased from his own works. That means I'm not trying to do it. I'm just coming into what God has completed for me. Same thing with the promised land. God said, I have given it to you. Now conquer it. It's yours. Take it. Same thing for you and me through the cross of Christ. Christ finished the work. He's saying it's yours. Enter in. So that's the place of rest. Where I, you and I enter into what God has completed for you and me. Everything. But looking back at the Old Testament, he says there were two reasons why they didn't enter into that place of rest. And we saw it. They had to have faith and obedience. You put it in the positive. He mentions unbelief and disobedience. We put it in the positive. They had to have faith and obedience. Two things. So rest equals faith and obedience. Amen? To enter into this place of rest, you and I need to be in faith and obedience. Faith in the promise of God, in the word of God. And walk in obedience. You will be in this place of rest. And in that place of rest, doesn't mean you won't have battles. You'll have battles. Doesn't mean you don't have things to conquer. You have to. But you engage from this place of rest. You fight your battles from this place of rest. You do your conquests from this place of rest. You're in a place of faith and obedience. Does this make sense? You understand? That your place of rest in God, your place of faith and obedience, is how you fight your battles and how you make your conquests. So that you can enjoy the milk and honey. The provisions that God has already made for you and me in Christ. From this place of faith and obedience. Now, let's break it down. And apply it to real life scenarios. And I have just mentioned five, or will be mentioning five scenarios very quickly. Because what he's telling us here is this, that believers can miss their land of promise, just like them in the old. The word has been preached. The promises have been given. But believers, New Testament believers, you and me, can fail to enter into that land of promise, can fail to enter into that place of rest. He's telling us, and that's why he's saying, let us fear. lest we fail to enter into the land of promise. Let us be careful. So, this is something very important. Just because you hear the promise of God doesn't mean it's going to be fulfilled in your life and mine. Just because you know that it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's going to be fulfilled in your life and mine. Why? Because we have to have faith and obedience to enter in to the land of promise. So how do we apply it? Let's look at some scenarios. For example, the first scenario is contending for success in life. For some of us, this may not be an issue. You're already successful. You're doing well as a student. Uh, maybe you're in college. Maybe you've just started working. Maybe you are already, you know, midlife, doing very well. For some of us, this may not be an issue. But I have sat before people who have come and said, I tried this, it failed. Now I'm talking about believers, Christians. 
I tried this, it failed. Then I tried that, it failed. Then I tried that, it failed. And I tried that, it failed. And then we hear that they've tried five times, six times, and they've all failed. What will you tell them? Are you going to tell them? This is God's will for your life, to be a failure? You'd be lying if you do that. Because that's not the word of God. Are you going to tell them this is your lot in life to be a failure? When you go to heaven, don't worry, you'll get your mansion. You say, but I'm living here on earth right now. I know there's a mansion there, but a mansion in heaven doesn't help me while I'm here. What are you going to tell them? Is the land a promise for them or not? Are the promises for them or not? Is God a partial God? Does God have favorites? No. The promise says of God is for that person as much as it is for any person, any other believer. And so what must we do? Say, listen, faith and obedience will get you into your land of promise. There may be giants. And maybe the giants are much bigger than you. And maybe you've got seven giants. Or seven nations greater and stronger than you. But God promised. That it is for you. And you can enter in. And we've just listed some scriptures on each of these scenarios we're going to look at. But then you take them to the word of God. Take them to Deuteronomy 28 verse 12. Where God said, I will bless you in all the work of your hands. In Joshua 1.8, he said, if you will meditate in my word and you keep my word, you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. In Psalm 1 verse 3, he says, you know, if blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. And, 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 and he says in verse 3, he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He will, his leaf will not wither. He'll bring forth his fruit in its season. His leaf will not wither. And whatever he does will prosper. Does that verse apply to a few of God's people or all of God's people? Let me hear you. Oh, so you can tell this person, this brother or sister, whoever, who's, been, who's had this series of failures, is so uh, you know, depressed and whatever. Hey, listen, you can enter into your land of promise. What you need is faith and obedience and you will enter into your place of rest. You take this word. Now, don't just hear the word. You've got to mix faith with it. So if it means every day you spend 15 minutes reading these promises that guarantee you success in life, do it. Because you need to hear it and you need to mix faith with it. Go over those same scriptures. Read it and say, God blesses me in all the work of my hands. I make my way prosperous and I have good success. I am like the tree spoken of in Psalm 1 and verse 3. I am like the tree uh, that that's planted by rivers of water. I will bring forth my fruit in its season. My leaf will not wither and whatever I do will prosper. That's my inheritance. That's my promised land. I am getting in there and no man on earth and no devil from hell can stop me from entering in to my land of promise. I am mixing faith with the word of God. And if you have to do that every day, do it every day until it becomes a reality in your life because it is what God has spoken to you. Are you listening? God has no favorites. This is not something that will work for somebody and not work for somebody else. The only thing that God requires of us is He says, look, you need to have faith and you need to have obedience to enter into your land of rest and to enter into your land of promise, to enter into what I have already prepared for you. It's already done. The works are completed. It is yours. Think about another scenario. This is again a very common one. I just picked a few. Think about a real estate problem. Do Christians have real estate problems? Of course. And then you hear, and when, when, when believers come and share, look, this is what, I invested this money into buying this property, whether it's a land or an apartment or whatever, or what are they doing? And then this, all these legal problems came. And they're struggling. Well, what do you do? Do you say, this is God's will for you? 
You say, sorry, you don't have an answer? No. Let's go to the Bible. What does the Bible say? Is there any promise in the Bible that you and I can stand on? There are some scriptures. And we've listed some of them there. Psalm 103, verse 6. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Now we all read Psalm 103, we read the first two verses. He forgives my sins, he heals my diseases, amen. Those are the benefits. Excuse me, read some more. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all. Don't forget all his benefits. He forgives your sins. He heals your diseases. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. And the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. That's part of the benefits. Take it. Take it. So God, this situation, these people are oppressing me. These people are illegally, unlawfully violating something. And you are the God who said, you, my benefit is you will execute righteousness and justice for me. Or take another verse, Psalm 125 verse 3. It says, the scepter of the wicked will not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. The scepter, the rule, the control, the influence of the wicked will not rest on the land that is allotted to the righteous. It's in the Bible, real estate verse. It's in the Bible. It's your promise. But you need to mix faith with it. Don't read it and just underline it, yellow color, orange color, keep it there. No, it's got to get into your heart, please. Because with the heart, man believeth, not with a color highlighter. It's with the heart, man believes. It's got to get into your heart and you've got to believe it and say, no scepter of the wicked will rest on this land because it's allotted to me. That's the courage, that's the determination, that's the fire that's got to be in your heart. Because you've got to mix faith with the word. Otherwise, a word given to you is of no use. The scepter of the wicked will not rest on the land allotted to the, allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hand to iniquity. God doesn't want us to do that. So you go before God. Say, God, this is your word. This is what has been promised to me. This is what has been given to me. Your word has been proclaimed to me. I am mixing faith with it, and I will do my part. I will walk in obedience. I'm not going to do anything wrong, illegal. No, I'm doing my part. I'm walking righteously. That word has to be fulfilled. Think about another scenario. A healing for our bodies. You know, same thing. What did God say in his word? And these are just a few scriptures. There are many scriptures. Exodus 23, 25. He said, You will serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from your midst. He didn't say, you serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and your water and bless you with sickness. He didn't say that. He said, I will take sickness away from you. God is the sickness taker away, not the sickness giver. Just read the Bible properly. He said, I will take sickness away from your midst. You know, I was really, really hurt this past week when I heard about Nickel. I was really hurt. I was really hurt. He was just 33 years old. And I said, God, this cannot happen. This cannot happen. Now, it, it shocked me because I didn't know he was struggling. I didn't know what was going on in his life. But suddenly when I heard that, He's gone. I said, God, this is not right. The Bible says, 
none of these diseases shall come on you. And I said, God, I mean, I'm not trying to elevate my place, but as a spiritual leader, I said, God, this is happening while I am a pastor in this congregation. I mean, when I say congregation, not central, but as a church community, it's not right. How can I allow that to happen? So I'm taking it on my responsibility and along with us as a pastoral team, from our spiritual side, saying, God, what you said in your word must happen in us as a community. You said none of these diseases shall come on you. Exodus 15, 20, 26. We always sing Jehovah Rapha. But what, what, does, what does that mean? What does Jehovah Rapha? He said in that same verse, none of these diseases shall come on you because I am Jehovah Rapha. That's what Jehovah Rapha means. It's not a nice title we give to God. It means none of these diseases shall come on you. I said, God, sorry for letting that happen under my watch. It's not right. Same thing with Mr. Sivaram. I, you know, it just, it just happened so fast. And I, God. But I am determined that what God said in Exodus 26 must be an experience for us as his people. Amen? And that's why we teach the word. Why? There's no point in having a Bible if you don't believe it. Amen? You can have any other book then. God said, Exodus 23, 25, You serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from your midst. No one shall be barren. No one shall suffer miscarriage. And the number of your days I will fulfill. Meaning you will live out the full course of your life. That's his promise. And there are many other healing scriptures. But what must we do? Faith and obedience. Mix faith with that word. This is for me. This is for our community. This is for us as a church. If the church in the Old Testament, if, you know, Psalm 105 verse 37 says, there was not one sick person in all their tribes. Can you imagine 40 years in the wilderness, not one sick person? That's what happened. There's not one sick person, all the tribes, except the ones for disobedience. But otherwise, not one sick person. Say, God, keep us as a community like, community like that. But you and I must mix faith with the word of God. If it means you take time every day to feed your spirit with the scriptures on healing, put it into your heart, saying, this is the word of God. I'm mixing faith with the word that, I, that, is, that, that I've heard, that I'm reading. I'm mixing faith with it. God, I believe it because it's with the heart man believes. And God, I'm receiving this word. Let it be fulfilled. Amen? Two quick scenarios. I know we're, we're, we're close to the end, but think about family, contending for your family. What did God say in his word? And again, these are just a few scriptures. You'll find many. Proverbs 3.33, the second part of that verse. He blesses the habitation of the just. That's the King James Version, but if you put it in modern terms. He blesses the house of the righteous. Proverbs 12, 7, second part of that verse. The house of the righteous will stand. It's not talking about building. The house, the family. The house of the righteous will stand. Psalm 118, verse 15. In the house of the righteous, there is the voice of rejoicing and salvation. Salvation means total well-being. There's a voice of rejoicing, not argument, fighting, fussing, not the voice of sound of empty dishes flying. <laughs> Just joking. In the house of the righteous, there is the voice of rejoicing and salvation. It's in the Bible. Isaiah 32 verse 18. And my people will live in peaceful habitations, in Secure dwellings and in quiet 
resting places. It's in the Bible. This is what God wants for his people. Are you going to mix faith with it? Yes or no? If you don't mix faith with it, it won't trouble you. It'll remain in the Bible. <laughs> but if you say, God, it's there in the Bible. It's my promise. It's the promised land. It's what you want for your people. I'm going to mix faith with it. And I'm going to walk into it. It's for every, every believer. Every household can experience what God has said. But you mix faith with that word. This is the way it's going to be in my house. There will be the voice of rejoicing and salvation. This is the way it's going to be in my house. The house of the righteous will stand. This is the way it will be in my house. The blessing of God is upon this house. You mix faith with the word. Amen. Last one. For financial sufficiency. What are you going to do with it? Psalm 23 verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd and he keeps me always in want. No. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's the Bible. Philippians 4.19. Paul is writing, and there are many scriptures. We're just giving a few. He's writing to the believers in Philippi. He says, my God will supply all your needs. He's not just simply saying something to make it look good. He's speaking God's word. My God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory through Jesus Christ. Listen to 2 Corinthians 9.8. It says, God will make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things will abound to every good work. It's covered in everything. Everything is covered. At 2 Corinthians 9.8, it's for the New Testament believer. What will he do with that word? The word preached to them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So you and I have to mix faith with the word. Believe God, that's for me. You might be in a situation of need, but that's how you fight your battles. Enter into this place of rest, of faith and obedience in God. And from there, you will conquer. From there, you'll fight your battles. From there, you'll enter in and enjoy what God has provided for you in your land of promise. I want to close with this thought. In Romans, the 16th chapter, verses, uh, verse 20. In Romans 16, 20, verse 17, you can come up, please. Paul writes, he says, And the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Now this is a privilege for every believer. Now when you read that, when you read the preceding verses in Romans 16, Paul actually mentions, he says, you know, there are people there who are trying to cause divisions among you. They kind of fight and cause all those problems. And he says, don't, do, don't have anything to do with them. And then he says, the God of peace. The implication is this. You keep yourself in a place of peace. Don't get into all these things around you. You keep yourself in a place of peace, and the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. That's what he said. Why did he say God of peace? Because he said, you keep yourself in peace. People are trying to do No. People are trying to do things around you. You keep yourself in peace. And the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. Being in rest is a place of peace. Then you and I enter into this place where we are in faith and obedience. Then all these anxieties, the nervous wrecks, the nervous breakdowns, and all just, just get rid of it. Because you've entered into your place of peace. Faith and obedience to God. And in your place of peace, you're invincible. In your place of peace, you'll walk in mastery over Satan. Are you listening? Amen. So this morning, 
To sum up, promised land. Every promise is available. Everything Christ has provided for you and me is available. But we must enter in. That promised land is a place of blessing, but there are battles. It's a place of rest in order to make conquest. But he's told us exactly how to enter in. He said faith and obedience. You have faith in God, his word. Obey his word. You will enter into this place of rest. And from rest, you conquer. From rest, you fight your battles. In that place of rest, the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. Amen. What are you doing? You're in a place of faith and obedience to God. Amen. Why don't you take some time just to pray, please? However, God has spoken to you this morning through His Word. Please take a few moments to pray. Father God, you know that as we journey through life, we face problems, we have our challenges, there are battles. Some enemies may seem greater and stronger than us. But God, you said, we'll conquer, we'll win, we'll enter in to your promises. So, Father, you know each battle, each one is fighting, God. The struggles, the challenges, the difficulties. Each one. But you have guaranteed victory. Because your word says that you always cause us to triumph in Christ. I pray that today our holy determination will grip every heart. People will see victory as the only choice they're going to, as the only outcome they will choose. They will not settle for anything else because it's their promised land. And Father, in every area of our lives, may we enter into your promises. Whether it's in the work we do, whether it's in finances, whether it's in healing, whether it's in our family, may we enter into your promises. They're waiting for us. They're waiting for us. May each one take a hold of your word, mix faith with the word. Obey it and see your promise fulfilled. Thank you, God. Let's rise to our feet, please. And the worship team will lead us in a time of just looking to God. And I know we're already over time, but as we sing, just let the Lord do His work in your life. Uh, go ahead.
the blind to see is moving here in front of me moving here in front of me the one who made the deaf to hear is silencing my every fear silencing my every fear oh the one who does impossible is reaching out to make me whole, reaching out to make me whole. The one who put death in its place, his life is flowing through my veins, his life is flowing through my veins. I believe in you. Father, we have proclaimed your word and you said that your word will not return to you void. It will not get back to you empty, God. That every promise we have spoken from your word will be fulfilled in the lives of your people. Now these are not empty promises, but these are the words of the God of heaven. And God, it will be fulfilled in the lives of your people. 
that we will enter in and we will see the word of God fulfilled in our lives. So Father, confirm your word with the miracles, with the healings, with the deliverances. Even as you watch over your word to perform it, God. Let people be delivered of their sicknesses and diseases, of financial distresses, of of confusions in the homes, of oppression in their lives. Confirm your word in the lives of your people, God. And let people come with testimonies. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He changed my mind. He delivered my soul. He turned my finances around. He turned my family around. He saved my son, my daughter. Look what the Lord has done. Father, let there be testimonies in the house of God. Of your word. Of what you do in the lives of your people. Because you are God. Your word is truth. And your spirit is at work. So let each one hear God, experience the goodness of God in their lives. Be glorified in their lives. Let it draw others to you. When the sinner sees the goodness of God, let him be drawn to taste and see for himself that the Lord is good. When the unrighteous, when the oppressor sees the goodness of God, Lord, draw them in by your goodness because it is the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. They see the goodness of God in our lives. Let it cause them to repent and come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Do this, Father. Be glorified, be glorified, be glorified. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, God. Praise your name. Praise your name. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. I was just, while I was praying, I just saw this lady wearing a purple sari and standing in front of me. And so I'm scanning the audience to see if that person is here. Uh, Seemed like to me her name was Shalini. Seemed like to me she was the headmistress of some school. Is that person here? I don't know. Anyone relate to what I was saying? Anyone? I don't know. I don't know if this person is here or watching online. But anyway. Okay. Never mind. Get it right. Thank you. So when I'm doing this, I'm not just wasting your time. (laughs) I'm just trying to listen to God if he has a word to speak to any person. And and if that happens, I just like to say it. So that's all I'm doing, right? So I appreciate you bearing with me. I'm not wasting your time. I'm just trying to see if God has a word for a person or a people. If he has a word, I'll say it. And if not, we will close and go. Okay? That's all. Okay. Let's close. Let's close.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each one of us always. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, publication, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcbiblecollege.org. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play Store.